les up guys? J'espère que vous allez bien, que vous êtes en pleine forme. Bienvenue sur le podcast de Conversation Awesome avec Karma Kill. A place where we speak Franglish, say the word awesome a lot, mais surtout un endroit d'inspiration et d'éducation pour vous aider à optimiser votre santé globale from the inside out. Mon nom est Claudia, fondatrice de Karmakin, et ma mission avec ce podcast est de t'amener dans un monde de développement personnel, d'optimisation d'habitudes de vie et de découverte so you can unleash your potential and live the life you truly want and deserve. Merci d'être à l'écoute. You're awesome. La conversation d'aujourd'hui est triplement awesome parce que, bon, il y a moi, mais il y a aussi non seulement un, mais deux invités spéciaux que je veux te présenter aujourd'hui. J'ai l'honneur de recevoir deux de mes grands amis, Ken et Barat, qui sont hilarants, premièrement, c'est important de dire qu'ils sont hilarants, c'est vraiment deux hommes qui ont des cœurs d'enfants, qui sont knowledgeable, like there's no tomorrow. Ils connaissent tellement, tellement de choses sur la santé, surtout la santé, bon, du corps, évidemment, du système digestif, des hormones, du métabolisme, de nos organes. Et avec leur entreprise Be Elite, ils aident les clients, mais aussi les coachs, comme moi, à aider nos propres clients à utiliser une méthode qui s'appelle le Stress Reduced Fat Loss. Donc une façon de, oui, perdre du gras, mais aussi de guérir vraiment notre corps from the inside out grâce à la nutrition et aux suppléments, et évidemment aussi grâce aux bonnes habitudes de vie. Donc je les reçois aujourd'hui pour parler d'hormones pour les femmes, right? Donc tout ce qui est periods, PMS... La ménopause, on va défaire des mythes, on va donner des trucs pratico-pratiques pour vous aider à passer à travers vos cycles de façon beaucoup plus bon, calme, sans trop de symptômes, avec moins de douleur. Fait que c'est un sujet purement féminin aujourd'hui. But uh, gentlemen, vous pouvez quand même être à l'écoute pour aider vos femmes et vos sœurs et vos mères à travers ça. Et comme je vous disais, on amène le tout d'une façon très, très pertinente avec toutes sortes d'informations et une touche d'humour comme Ken et Brad savent si bien le faire. Donc, euh, je les connais depuis plusieurs années. Et oui, encore une fois, à travers le cercle, la petite communauté de Joe et Sarah, on a fait le mastermind ensemble pendant à peu près un an, peut-être un petit peu moins. Avec Brad, je travaille aussi tout le côté spirituel de mon développement. Donc, ils sont aussi maîtres Reiki, Barat est chaman, il utilise toutes sortes de plantes vraiment puissantes et pertinentes pour aider les gens à guérir aussi from the inside out. J'ai fait quelques retreats avec eux, ils m'ont aidé dans mon développement personnel dans les deux dernières années, surtout à un niveau que je peux même pas dire en mots. Donc, je suis tellement reconnaissante de vous les présenter aujourd'hui à travers le podcast. Il y a beaucoup, beaucoup de sujets qu'on aurait pu aborder parce que, comme je vous ai dit, ces deux hommes-là, c'est des bibles de connaissances sur des sujets super variés. And hopefully, on va pouvoir les revoir pour partie 2, partie 3. Mais aujourd'hui, on rentre dans un sujet qui va vraiment vous aider à « manage your cycles », comme je disais, « with a little less pain » et avec un peu plus de « understanding » de ce que vous pouvez faire parce que non, c'est pas normal d'avoir des cycles à chaque mois qui sont douloureux et non, c'est pas normal d'avoir une pré-ménopause, une ménopause qui nous change Complètement. Donc, sans plus tarder, let's dive into the interview et l'entrevue se fera en anglais pour aujourd'hui. Welcome, guys, to this awesome conversation. I'm super grateful to have you with me today to discuss a very important topic. So we have Bharat here with us today. Hi. And then we have Ken. How are you doing? Thanks for being here, guys. There was so many things we could talk about because you guys are just full of knowledge. So I'm already going to tell everybody who's listening right now to go follow you on Instagram, all the content you're creating for us. Even for me, I can help my client with that content. So it's just been amazing to be part of like your group, your, your group of friends and everything to learn from you and then to use whatever you guys coach on and use with your clients for me as a person, but also for me as a coach. So again, super grateful to have you with us today for this awesome conversation. We're going to dive in a very important topic because obviously mainly women listen to this podcast. My clients are 95% women. And I think we tend to normalize a lot of things related to our cycles, to our periods, to our PMSing, to women who are entering menopause. And I hear a lot of questions and a lot of comments about, oh, 
I'm craving so much sugar, but it's normal, quote unquote normal, because I'm going to have my period. I'm gaining so much weight, but my doctor said it was normal because I'm in my menopause. So I think we normalized a lot of what's happening before our cycles or when we enter different phases in terms of like our hormones and everything. So I'm excited to dive into that. I think it's going to be a lot of aha moments for the women listening to us. And I guess the goal of this conversation is to help us women go through these cycles with a little less pain and a little less sugar binges and, you know, weight gain and all of that. So let's start with PMSing, right? So during the week or the few days prior or period every single month, we tend to think that it's normal to have really intense symptoms like mood swings, pimples in our faces, uh, cravings is a huge one, being more emotional, being more aggressive, being more, you know, fatigued or have less energy. So what would you guys consider as quote unquote normal symptoms that we could be experiencing? And then what is maybe a limit or something that's actually not normal and that we could actually avoid feeling every single month? Wow. Do you want to talk about this or do you want me to jump right in here? Hey, I told you why I'm here. So (laughs) why are you here? What a joker. (laughs) All right. Well, the space, that's what I'll do. Well, one of the, to be honest, most of the issues that we see premenstrual aren't normal. You know, Mm -hmm. they're all signs of the liver being inflamed and some other things we're going to talk about today, but to actually, you should walk into your cycle and go, Hey, my app says my cycle is coming. Oh, okay. That's why it's here. And that, Besides going to that and menstruating, that should be really the lead up. Mm-hmm. Everything else is just a sign of, like I said, the liver being backed up or having other issues that, like I said, we're going to talk about today. So there aren't any normals, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, however you want to look at that. So Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And I think you guys experience this with your clients plenty of time. And so do I, you know, like, oh my God, I got my period and I didn't even notice it. Right. It just happened. I didn't have any crazy symptoms. I didn't gain like six pounds. So I think this is always a shock because like I said, in conversations that we have, you know, with women, it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to have a period. So I have this, this, and that. So that's a first really big thing. That's important to understand. It's not normal to have crazy symptoms every month. Another question that I always get is, oh, why is there like some months are not as bad? And then once every two, three cycles, then my symptoms will be, you know, heavier or more noticeable or, and I certainly experienced this myself. I would have, I have very easy cycles and I don't really have any symptoms, but once in a while I would have like a week before my period that I would get more symptoms like that. Yes, there's the liver and we'll talk about the reasons, but is there other specific, maybe shorter term influences like stress or lack of sleep or crazy workouts that could influence the symptoms pre-cycle? Yeah, for sure. So let's just look at some of the factors that affect your period, right? So I find for women periods, well, obviously for women, periods are (laughs) an indicator of how the system is working overall. So we always track women's periods because that tells us about different factors. So uh, let's look at nutrient deficiencies, right? So a lot of women are under eating and undernourished. Mm. So that's going to affect the period. Um, Blood sugar. How are they doing managing blood sugar? Not just a couple of days before the period, but just generally. Yeah. Right. Uh, Then there's the inflammation piece, right? Are they, are they eating foods that are inflaming their system? Uh, Do they have a imbalance in gut bacteria? Um, Because all of that releases cortisol as well, right? Mm -hmm. So their stress hormone goes off. How's their sleep quality? Um, How's their detoxification? How's their elimination, like bowel movements, right? So all of these things affect your period. It's not just, you know, hey, I took a pill and my period is better or worse. Oh, well, talking about the pill, there's also birth control and, you know, IUD or even, let's say, uh, medications. Mm -hmm. All these factors affect the period. So the better your period is, the better your system overall is usually. Yeah. So if the period is not the real normal, Mm -hmm. then that's telling us, okay, we need to look at one of these or some of these factors. Right. Right. But to answer your question, sometimes, yeah, it may have to be like, okay, in the last three to four weeks, what was stress like? What Mm -hmm. was the quality of sleep like? Were you training more than usual and not possibly recovering? Right. right. Maybe let's say you start training more. And there's a common thing, especially when women want to drop body fat, they'll start 
doing more and eating less, mm-hmm. right? And that's affecting recovery. So yeah, there could be factors like that, which can cause that situation where, hey, not many symptoms and then very strong symptoms. Right. Yeah, so some factors that we can do on a day-to-day weekly basis to prevent like normal symptoms and then making sure that a couple days or a couple weeks even prior that we manage these factors yeah. as well. You mentioned inflammation, which is part of so many issues in terms of your digestion, uh, illnesses, just being sick, having brain fog. I mean, that factor influences so many things in our health. What can cause inflammation in terms of food? Let's start with food. And again, some people don't like to hear this, but if you also say it with me, maybe more people will be open to making the changes. But what are some common foods that we eat on a day-to-day basis that can cause inflammation? So let's say in terms of food, it would be the, we call them the furious five, right? These are foods that tend to damage anyone's system. Now, how much damage it causes or how much inflammation it causes depends on how sensitive the person is and some, a lot of other factors, but you have your five foods that we always suggest eliminating from the diet. Um, Gluten being one. Yeah. Dairy, any form of dairy, Um, corn, well, sugar, let's say sugar first, and then corn and soy, Mm. right? So those are five foods that we always encourage people to start eliminating. That alone, so much will shift. Like Mm -hmm. they might just eliminate that because they want to improve their period, but they'll probably notice their waist gets leaner, bowel movements get better, uh, their energy increases, brain fog clears, like you name it, skin gets better. A lot of things will shift from being consistent with just doing that. Yeah, for sure. And about soy, because, you know, you do your research and you read about it and there's two schools of thoughts, if I can say some of them are like pro soy, especially for vegans, you know, and then on the other side, there's the whole, it can play with your hormones. There is a lack of study. So we're not quite sure. And I like to say that, you know, broccoli, nobody disagrees that broccoli is good for you. So if you're going to eat something there, there's really two sides of it. Like, I don't really want to risk it for my health. If there's a lot of people saying it's not good for you and can cause inflammation, it's usually modified and da, da, da. I don't even want to maybe try to see if the other side of the research might be right. But then for people who don't eat meat or fish, Soy usually is one of their main source of protein. So what would you recommend for protein sources for vegans or vegetarians? A lot of times they can sprout things. So Mm -hmm. this really depends on digestibility because if your digestive system can handle it, sprouting beans, you know, nuts, seeds are a great way of doing it, doing things that will increase your amino acid profile, increases uh, digestibility by lower the lectins, which are plants defenses. You know, so those are great ways of doing things, but even sometimes when people sprout, they still don't feel well. So things like hemp is, is decent, like hemp seeds, pumpkin seeds are a decent source of protein, vegan proteins, collagen, I guess that's full and broth based, probably not, but you know, uh, pea protein is a one on the line, like I know butter can have pea protein, I can't, uh, but mm-hmm. still a good source, rice protein. So they can do a lot of things along that line. I think that's usually where we do it. And then amino acids, doesn't seem tasty, You Mm -hmm. can't put the amino acids in a stew and make it nice, but (laughs) it is something that gives them a very good uptake of nitrogen Mm -hmm. um, and amino acid profile. So we do have a lot of our clients that are vegan have great amino acids. One we use is called MAP, so Master Amino Pattern, probably one of the best ones out there. And they pair that with their their meal. They may throw five or six and then Mm -hmm. have a salad or vegetables or rice and then still keep blood sugar under controls. Yeah, I think mix and matching different sources of protein, especially when you don't eat meat, is like a great way to make sure you have all the variety of amino acids. And to touch point on soy again, like how would you explain specifically how it can create inflammation or play with like her hormones? A lot of times, you know, it's A, it's digestibility. So where's the soy coming from? You know, if it's a lot of people that have soy are going to go with non-GMO because they're already concerned with the sitting in vats of manganese and having neurotoxins floating in their system. So that's one way of looking at it. Right. The other way for a lot of people, again, when they look at the digestibility of the protein, it doesn't score that high. The mm. protein in soy is amazing. When they, when they rank it against like chicken or anything else, it's ranked very high, almost higher actually. But the digestibility, the way the body can break down that shell and actually absorb it, it's hard for our gut to do so. So mm. it does cause a lot of dampness, a lot of like, you know, 
cold system in the body, which is more mucus, more fluid. And again, that's not great because now the walls of the intestine are going to get a little bit more leaky and you have a little bit more issues. And that's really what we saw. We, although we were told when we were, we were taught not to have soy, it was in our own practice with our clients over the last two decades. We just saw it. Mm-hmm. When, when we used to do a lot of caliper testing, remember that about it back in the day, we caliper tested for the first probably 15 years of our life. So clients having soy, we would just see hamstring and, you know, and leg measurement just going up mm-hmm. every week. So we were like, okay, this isn't just what they're saying. This is what we're seeing. Big thing for a lot of people to look at is sometimes you do need to experience it and go, okay, I'm going to have soy for three months and see what happens in my body. Right. So mm-hmm. Yeah. If anyone wants to look deeper into that, there's a really good book. It's called The Whole Soy Story. The Whole Soy Story. Yeah, it's fantastic. Okay. Thank you for the recommendation. Okay. So we know what not to eat to, to help inflammation. Is there anything that we can add to our diets or eat more of the week before our periods to make sure that the cravings don't go through the roof and that we can stabilize, like you said, blood sugar, inflammation and all that? Um, yeah, for sure. So I would say not even just before, like the week of the period or before the Just in the general. Period. Generally, I think women need to add certain foods that they don't eat enough of. Mm-hmm. Um, I would definitely say proteins, especially like red meat, wild game, those need to increase for most women because they have nutrients in there. Besides protein, there's so many other nutrients in there that helps with blood sugar, detoxification, liver function, all those things. So that's really important. Um, healthy fats, right? Mm. Uh, I think a lot of people know healthy fats are good, yeah. but I don't think they eat enough of it because I think there's still that fear of I'll get fatter or mm-hmm. I'll put on weight. And even if they do, then it's usually the same, maybe almonds and olive oil <clears throat> and maybe coconut oil is a little popular now, but I think just increasing the variety of fats with, you know, let's say grass-fed butter, grass-fed ghee, beef tallow, using variety of other oils as well, avocado, olives, Uh, A lot of people don't realize olives is great fats. Mm -hmm. So improving that fat profile in the nutrition, super important. Uh, But then uh, one strategy that we use for women is the week leading up to the period and the week of, we start increasing their carbs. Mm -hmm. They have higher carbs during that time. And then post that, they can come back down. So that's a really helpful strategy because we find not only do they have less cravings, Um, but they'll sleep better and they have less symptoms. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And when you say increase carbs, I'm sure you don't mean more cookies and (laughs) what kind of carbs should we be adding? Could be anything from rice, rice pasta, could be variety of potatoes, stuff like that. Yeah. If they can digest it, if they can handle it, quinoa might be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Staying away from gluten because you don't want to increase your carbs and then raise inflammation, but then having that. uh... Right. Yeah, perfect. And, and there are a couple other things that we can still do too, right? There's still specific, if you look at, I don't know if you want to talk about the specific ones as well. Like if someone's bloated, what can they do or something else? Sure. Like that's, there's also things we can look at. Like if someone's bloated, a lot of times it is potassium, right? So potassium, giving them a potassium supplement, um, that helps control water in the body. So a lot mm-hmm. of times if clients have a lot of bloating or weight gain during that time, yeah. recommend take a potassium supplement, you know, either that seven to 10 days out or the whole 28 days before. And they'll notice as cycles progress, they'll have less. I have client, clients start with maybe getting six pounds, then four, then two, then none. And eventually mm-hmm. they'll have no, no bloating because their body's better with the water. Um, right. If they're having things like cravings, you know, obviously one of the things we have to look at is yeast fungus. They may need to get into fixing the gut a little bit, you know, using oil of oregano, uh, berberine, other things to clean the gut, or they can take chromium polynicotinate, which helps with insulin and and cravings and cramps as well. So mm-hmm. I bring that the hard way. I gave one of my daughters chromium. She was, hey, you know, my cramps are gone. You know, yeah. I'm like, oh. So, but we've realized I looked up chromium and that's what it does. So it actually helps mm-hmm. with cramps. So, and then lastly, if they're having a lot of mood issues or, or you know, uh, mood issues, those are different estrogens that are foreign that we don't want. So using things like DIM or calcium deglucurate, you see products like EstroSmart, they're great products for targeting the different estrogen, one makes you angry, one makes you sad. So you can, mm. they can focus on that. And then obviously the, the last one is painful cramps. So like staying home and not being able to go anywhere using yeah. uh, a good vitamin E, like, you know, we like to use vitamin E one-to-one by Metagenics. It's a really strong antioxidant and a high dose of magnesium. And usually people get rid of those painful cramps that need Midol a lot of the time. So those are mm-hmm. nice little remedies they could do, which are safer than the Midol and the Advils. And yeah, for sure. Issues, right? So. 
Yeah, absolutely. Anything else that maybe doesn't relate to food? You mentioned sleep, you mentioned stress. How does that affect our bodies and our hormones? I mean, that's a big topic all in itself, obviously, but like the main takeaways that we can prioritize even the week before, or like just in general to make sure that the symptoms are not as bad. So sleep for sure. I think that's one of the most powerful tools we have for any, like just optimal health, right? Mm -hmm. So the issue is when a lot of people don't sleep well, and that's that alone needs to be defined what sleeping well actually means. Yeah. Because a lot of people think, yeah, I get eight hours of sleep, but if you're not going into deep states of sleep, um, then you're not recovering. But what also happens is, especially most people, they're not going to bed till like 11, midnight, things mm -hmm. like that. And so what happens, a lot of toxins literally get backed up into the liver. So instead of the, you know, the bowels and the sweat glands and kidneys eliminating toxins, they actually get sent back to the liver and gallbladder. So now they get backed up. And then when the period comes, there's more things to eliminate. Mm -hmm. So liver gallbladder is already backed up and now there's excess estrogen that it has to process. And that's where, you know, a lot of the period symptoms can happen, but even for menopausal women, that's how night sweats, hot flashes will happen because of those reasons. So, you know, going to bed by 10, 10, 30 latest, mm -hmm. um, taking your magnesium before that, turning lights off, electronics off at least 60 minutes before bed, yeah. um, sleeping in like a bat cave, like pitch black room, This might be exciting for some people, sleep naked, because uh, your body will try to regulate the temperature uh, mm -hmm. and that helps them sleep deeper. Uh, Ken why, has, I, Ken why has am I here? Damage. I should just go, I should just leave. Well, after you <laughs> drop some bombs with all these types of estrogen, I feel like I have to say more just to sound smart. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying random things now. Oh, uh, you're hilarious. This kind, of, this kind of knowledge. <laughs> That's amazing. So I guess, again, going back to the symptoms, it's not normal to feel super tired and lack of energy the week before, right? You may have a difference. Like you might feel some difference, but it shouldn't be to the point where you can't wow, work out or right. yeah. Yeah. That's right. Right. yeah, like you will have a little bit of some cravings are more like your appetite going up is normal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, feeling a little more tired or sensitive emotionally normal but if it's like it starts affecting you how you feel your well-being your work your training things like that that's usually your body saying hey i need help that makes sense and speaking of working out uh again i've definitely experienced this myself sometimes athletes or even women who are undernourished they don't eat enough don't have all the nutrients train or just start moving more because like you said they want to lose weight or whatever or just super active people like myself our period will either skip a month once in a while or even for a few months in a row or they'll get like yeah, spotting, really yeah. spotting, a little bit spotting or like it'll last like a day instead of lasting four or five days and obviously this made me happy like cool I don't have a period this month but then again this is a sign that hmm maybe something's up with your body and your health can you guys talk a bit about that yeah and think of it this way right like if training is always great we never think of training as a bad thing and it isn't but <clears throat> training still releases stress hormone still releases yeah. cortisol. So when we train excessively and we see this with competitors or athletes that are really pushing that line of like, I'm recreational, I'm going for it. Stress hormone is elevated too much. And what is stress hormone is really a signal that there's danger. So when you think about evolutionary wise, is it a great time to conceive and do all these things and have proper body functions in a war? The body mm -hmm. shuts down to survival mode. So right. cycles, periods go away, you know, appetite goes away, bowel movements go away. All these things go away when stress hormone is excessively high. Sleep goes away because we are literally in a war state. So those are the things that happen. That's why the cycle will kind of dwindle and go over here because the body's like, we need to run, fight, and take all nutrients and put it into muscles so we can do what we need to do. Hmm. And having a cycle period isn't beneficial as, as much as staying asleep and having deep sleep wouldn't be beneficial. Yeah. So as we see with clients, again, a lot of times taking them off their program for just a week, you know, what? active rest, yoga, sauna, stretch, walk in nature, boom, period coming back, increasing fats, mm -hmm. providing hormone foundation, and then they're fine. Right. So. Yeah. So is that something that you would generally recommend a week of a period or the week before to like kind of have a deload week or just lower the training, or is it possible to maintain that high intensity training, but making sure that you adapt your nutrition and that would be the main focus. 
I would definitely say adaptive nutrition would be the primary one. Always the raise your game is better to change your nutrition, adapt the, the supplements, the sleep and all those things to, to support that week. Cause a lot of women can train. I'm sure you have, you train like, you yeah. know, like, like an animal going into your cycle period and you're fine. Yeah. So just watch it and, and adjust what you need to, and then bring it back down after that. That's probably a better way of doing it. So mm-hmm. unless someone's had chronic, I've missed my cycle chronically for a month, two months, three months, then I'd say, no, back off leading into it. Right. Let your system be okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And you mentioned fat for recovery. And I think that's super interesting because we're used to here after workout, have your carbs and have your proteins, right? Carbs to help with your glycogen level in your muscles and then protein to make sure that your muscles can recover and all of that. Again, this might be a bit of an aha moment, but I, again, definitely experienced this. Remember abroad, the first time we did my liver flush last year and I was in my strength training and I was like, I am so sore. And I was like, I'm eating a lot. I did the liver flush. I feel great. But the fats were really, really low during the week of the flush and even the week after. And I definitely felt it. So I feel like it's not the first macronutrient that will turn to to help with recovery because we're so used to like proteins and carbs after a workout. So can you explain how you would integrate a bit more fat? Is it right after your workout? Is this just in general in your nutrition? And why does it help that much with recovery? Um, so I would say post-workout, we'd probably still keep carbs, but then the rest of the meals will have some form of fats in there. Mm-hmm. So and avocado or just, you know, you're cooking with, let's say, beef tallow or something like that, right? But if you remember also when we were working together, one of the things we looked at when I said, hey, show me your training program. <laughs> it was, was like, a little crazy. Why? Yeah, I was like, why are you doing all this? Um, so we had to back off. Now, what a strategy that I like doing is the week of, the period, um, I like to switch the training to more like a power lifting style. So they focus purely on strength, like mm-hmm. three to five reps. They're resting probably five to 10 minutes in between sets instead of doing hypertrophy or something like that, right? Yeah, but like, like you both said, right? I think making sure that the nutrition matches the training and with women, like you said as well, they tend to start training more, but then eating less because they think that calories in, calories out. It's the only thing that's going to help me lose weight. And as we can understand now, it's not the case, especially in terms of being healthy and not just losing weight to lose weight. And health will dictate your periods and your symptoms and all of that. So it's all a nice little circle to uh, yeah. take into account. Another good uh, strategy just to add fats could be just taking high doses of fish oil and krill oil. Sometimes it may not be necessarily coming from food. It could just be, especially for women like yourself who are like more on the athletic side. And if they start like losing period, just jack up their fish oil or krill oil, like 30 grams a day, maybe. And that usually brings the period back. Mm-hmm. There you go. There we go. <laughs> Ken is taking notes. <laughs> I am, I am. If we don't share these things in our business anymore, we have our own. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, So if we switch gears and then go into more like menopause talk, because I feel like it's going to be quite some similar thoughts or, you know, the liver inflammation and all that. But then again, we hear things like, oh, it's normal that I'm gaining 20 pounds. I'm in my menopause. I have like crazy hot flashes. I can't sleep. It's normal. I should be on this hormone that my doctor gave me. It's normal. I have no other choices but we do have other choices. So what are some things that women can do maybe when they start feeling the first little signs or symptoms, or maybe they're premenopausal and uh, what, what can they do? Like, you know, to prevent these crazy hot flashes and symptoms and discomfort and pain. I find the biggest thing when it comes to menopause is it is similar to periods. Yes. And so when we learned it, it was how your cycles are and how you're treating them is how your menopause is going to be later. Mm. So if you don't deal with it, then you're going to deal with it later. Um, but most people that we see running into menopause, especially if they're early, stress is a big factor. Always, right. We always go back and ask the client, so if you went to menopause at 46, what was going on at 44? Mm. Well, I went back to school or I got divorced or I changed my job. So managing stress, I find, is a big thing. That's usually the thing that puts people into menopause early because it just inflames the liver. And the liver's right. like, I'm done. I've had too much. So managing stress, whether that's a proper stress protocol, yoga, meditation, breath work, you know, cold showers, inflammatory foods, those same things is the best way to get the liver to go, okay, I'm not stressed out. Yeah. I'm not, there's no fire in here. Let me just calm down and I can work on organizing the room, so to speak. So mm-hmm. that would be probably the best thing to do instead of saying, 
then after that, you can look at supplements. You can look at, at you know, your Estro Smart Pluses, your your DIM, your calcium deglucurates, your sulforaphane, all those things to help organize the foreign estrogens, progesterone and estrogen, because that's usually what the issue is. Progesterone and estrogen kind of get like eh, out of whack a little bit. And then mm-hmm. the body goes, that's where we're gaining and all these things. But first work on managing stress, I would say. Mm. I agree. I agree. Um, it's it's what you've been doing leading up to the menopause, mm-hmm. right? You know, all those symptoms that they say, what are they? The seven, seven dwarfs of menopause or something. If you oh yeah. Get, I've never heard that. It, it, yeah. it be something, whatever There's, If you Google it, you'll find this image and it's like, uh, this guy sets you up for all kinds of funny. I, I'm trying to bring the entertainment in here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see that. Um, but yeah, it, it, all of that will happen if you're not managing all the other stuff. All the factors that affect period are the same factors. The mm-hmm. reason menopause blows up the symptoms is because, you know, obviously natural production of estrogen stops. Right. And women don't realize how powerful estrogen is. Mm-hmm. Estrogen manages so many things from your thyroid to your cholesterol to your blood sugar, things like that. So such a powerful hormone when you stop making it naturally everything that was off balance is just going to go worse right so that's why those then those obvious all those symptoms start but it's it's rarely the menopause that did that to them those those were things already happening for years it's just like an amplifier yeah that's right. right that makes sense so what if somebody's listening to us right now and they're already in menopause and they did not take the time to prevent manage their stress sleep better da, da, da. what can they do like while they're in it that could help them go through it with a little less pain you mentioned some supplements you mentioned you know obviously removing the furious five but anything else that they can do like if they're in it right now and it's rough I find doing those actually work quite quickly. I know, mm. I know people want something else, but I'm like, these, those are powerful things right away. Because remember the food is inflammation. Yeah. If you've, ex- if you've removed external stress from your life and they change foods, like we've had women in menopause for five years, the doctor's like, you're done. And they remove the furious five, you know, start working on gut health with oregano, berberine, things like that. Um, sleep better, you know, and then their cycle comes back. Mm. whoa five years later what happened i'm 54 what's going on so these are powerful things that will happen to someone's body if they do it right away the body will start to heal one thing i will say is stop your alcohol Mm. most menopausal women that at least i don't know about ken but i've had almost i think every menopausal woman who's having strong symptoms uh drinks wine almost every night or a few times a night they need to cut that out like it's that alone will make a big difference. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Their heart flashes, night sweats will pretty much go away. Right. What do you guys say to women who are like, oh, I only eat like gluten once in a while, or I only have one glass of wine once a week, or like I only have cheese, but like in a very small portion, you know? The inflammatory response can be, I think, up to two weeks. It doesn't yeah. matter if it's a small portion or a big portion. But then when you do all of this little thing once in a while, when you look at your week, you're like, oh, I'm doing a lot of inflammatory behaviors or choices that right. can affect. So what would be the minimum, I guess, duration or then the minimum number of weeks that you avoid these for your five or alcohol to really start feeling the benefits? Would you say two weeks at the minimum or... I go a little bit further because remember, think of someone that's been maybe doing this drinking scheme or been eating gluten pretty much their whole life yeah. and unbeknownst to their symptoms. And if like you said, two hours to two weeks is the inflammatory period, one to three months is the repair period, they're oh. backed up. Yeah. So now you stop for a month and you're like, yeah, that bad guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's been a month and nothing's changed, <laughs> but they may need at least, I find anywhere like two months is where people really can calm that down. Mm-hmm. and get a real good picture anything sooner it could be you it could be not but two months is a a pretty safe period to go okay my my, my system's going to start changing clearly i'm going to see that so. yeah i think it gives your body a chance to feel what it's supposed to feel like when it's healthy and not inflamed and that's why i always tell my clients you know when we remove these foods and they're freaking out i was like well give your body a chance to feel how it's supposed to feel when it's top shape and working well and digesting well, and you don't have these crazy symptoms and crazy issues. And then you will feel empowered 
to then decide if it's worth it to have that glass of wine or that bread, you know? And then when you start feeling how you're supposed to actually feel, you don't really want to go back to eating these foods or feeling like that. So I think it's maybe hard because it, you know, it's habits. Like you said, it's stuff we we do for Mm -hmm. years, but then giving ourselves the opportunity to feel how we're supposed to feel and to have like easier periods or like a nicer way to move into menopause I think is all worth it you know they'll they'll get leaner as a side effect and I don't think anyone's complaining about that Mm. yeah because weight gain in menopause is again a normal thing like oh it's normal that I'm gaining weight you know and they're being told that it's normal but no like you you should not have to gain weight because you're in menopause you know quite the the opposite absolutely Mm -hmm. awesome anything else you guys want to share add in terms of hormones, period, stuff we can do, not do, menopause that could help I think our a lot of times look at how, it, when you, people always focus on the giving up part. And I always mm-hmm. say over the, how many years have you been having the wine or the cheese or the stuff that you shouldn't be? And your body's been like doing it. It's, it's like, it's in this like war. It's taking the shots for you. It's trying to heal. And sometimes we have to give things up for a short period of time so you can have it forever. You know, so you can go back to your wine next year and drink it for the next 20 years and look the way you want and have better menopause and have better everything, you know? So giving it up for a summer or for a period of time is a small a bit of exchange for what you're probably going to get and what you've been giving it to. Right. So mm-hmm. try to have, I think having that perception is important. Right. So otherwise at some point, someone will come to you in a white coat and say, this is so-and-so you can never have it again, you know, because your system, you know, so yeah. you want to stop it before then and heal and then, next summer you're back you're back at it in with a better system hopefully so Mm -hmm. yeah smarter choices better system a healed body as well so then you can handle these things in moderation and not get your system go through the roof that's right Mm -hmm. brad anything else you want to add on the topic i just want to tell people to start doing these things before they even start considering you know taking medications and hormones and I know women who are trying to like push these symptoms and they're like, Hey, I'm going to do some progesterone. Hey, I'm going to do this because my doctor said this or my naturopath said this. And they're just, it's, it's actually backfiring and it's not letting them move forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, At least that's been my experience with a lot of women. Actually, some of them are not even menopausal. They just need to take time to push the inflammation down, pull a lot of the uh, toxins out of the system uh, but because they're still struggling with the symptoms, they're like, I need to find something, which I understand, but it's, I know clients right now who are like suffering even more because they've, you know, done progesterone now mm-hmm. and the body's not responding very well because the system's backed up Yeah, and there's a new variable they're throwing in there. Right. So mm-hmm. um, not saying those things cannot help someone and they're all bad, but I would suggest do these things as foundation first before you go down that path, or even if you do go down that path, don't ignore the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. I always say, you know, if you walk in a house and like it's on fire and you come in with your glass of water and you just throw the glass of water on the fire, I mean, it's not going to make the fire worse, but is it really going to help? I feel like sometimes that's the same with like the detox tea or like the miracle pill that, or like, you know, that pill that your doctor gave you. It might, it might not, you know, make it worse, but is it really going to help if you don't focus on what actually caused the fire? I think that's a great way to see it as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think I learned that from you guys, actually, that analogy. <laughs> oh, no, that was well said. I'm like, I'm going to use problem. that myself. So. Okay. Well, <laughs> you can use know. it with your clients. <laughs> I will now. So amazing. That was super helpful. Um, where can we follow you if we want to reach out, ask some questions? If there's any women listening who need more help with that, how can they reach out to you, follow you, creep you out on uh, social? <laughs> I think both of all of our uh, Instagrams are all B underscore elite. And then you'll see us pop up, whether it be yeah. underscore Barat, B H A R A T, or underscore Ken. We even have a, cl- uh, a student underscore Kaylee who works for us now. She's awesome. Yeah, she um, is. So we have, we, you know, there's a, a lot of great ways they can find us. Info at bealite.ca is a simple email to fire off to us and uh, we will get that. So. Awesome. I will put all of that in the show notes. Uh, and I finish every interview with uh, one question for all my guests. I love quotes, as you may know, or maybe not. So I ask my guests at the end of every episode, what is one of your favorite quotes and why? 
It doesn't have to be related to today's topic, but any quotes that you like to live by or a mantra or an intention and why? Uh, for mine would definitely be now is not forever. Just from experiencing that myself, going through challenges in my life, realizing at the, my lowest times and my hardest times that, yeah, someone told me that now is not forever and things always change. You mm -hmm. know, things always got better and you look back and go, wow, it was just such an, a horrible, things seem so dead end there and they're better. So even for clients now, I tell them that when they're going through things, now is not forever. It will get better. Mm -hmm. I like that. Brad? Geez, I need like 10 minutes to think about this. I know, uh, I put you on the spot there. The first one that pops to mind. I will say that's by Ram Dass. Are you going to say it in English? So, like, so you speak 10 languages, you're going to say, ah, Gujarati, whatever. I could have hit someone, right? Like, it sounds so freaking intelligent. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, uh, I would say what Ram Dass always says, love everyone and tell the truth. Mm -hmm. um, that's been like a guiding mantra for me. So whether things are great or challenging or conflicting, uh, it's, it's a good principle to remember. Yeah, it's a hard one to live by, but it's a great one to remember. Amazing. Well, thank you guys. This was awesome. And I'm sure it was super helpful for our listeners. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. J'espère que cette conversation awesome t'a inspiré. Et d'ailleurs, I would love to hear back from you. Rejoins Carmackin sur les réseaux sociaux and tag me in a post pour partager ce que tu retiens de cet épisode. Je serais vraiment grateful aussi si tu pouvais me laisser un rating and review pour le podcast. Ça me permet d'avoir un impact positif sur plus de gens comme toi. Merci beaucoup d'avoir été à l'écoute and until next time, je te souhaite une journée awesome!